Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for deciding to come here instead of watching the Oscars on television. Um, I'm delighted that uh, you've come in. And um, th for those of you in the atrium, if you want to just come in and sit down, it, this, is, this will be funny and free and, uh, and not at all painful. You'll, you'll be surprised. Um, since the, I'm, having, the, I'm Dagny Corcoran, by the way, and this is Art Catalogs, LACMA's independent bookstore. Uh, and since 2011, Shauna Lutger has been investigating surrealist fistfights, many of which resulted from Andre Breton's fractious relationships with his fellow uh, surrealist colleagues. Shauna is fascinated with the interpersonal dynamics of the surrealists, and in particular with Andre Breton's infamous fistfights. For each fight, she conceives an installation with elements inspired by details of the conflict. Through sculpture, performance, and writing, she reframes and reinterprets the histories of surrealist fistfights. With research, she refers to as Le Nou Monocle, the history of fistfights of the surrealists. These investigations become the chapters of a book that Shauna will um, publish when her research is complete. Works from the series have been exhibited widely, including solo exhibitions at the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden, the Perez Art Museum in Miami, the 2014 Whitney Biennial, and Performa 13 in New York, and many others, Hauser and Wirth and other, lots of others. The lecture today tells the story behind the recent exhibition at Suzanne Vielmetters that was titled AKA Public Opinion and was the fifth installment for the new monocle. That exhibition was based on an incident from 1935 when Breton and a group of friends had dinner in a restaurant in Paris. Apparently, Breton saw Ilya Ehrenberg, the Russian writer who had criticized him in print the year before. He approached Ehrenberg and hurled insults at him before slapping him in the face with a green leather glove. In the gallery, Shauna set out over 300 leather gloves, each one representing a Los Angeles-based artist. Each artist sent Shauna a tracing of their non-dominant hand, and she then transformed the drawing's contours into oversized gloves in an array of colors. I'll let her tell the story. The two performers are Noor Mubarak and Eli Diner. And this is Shauna Lutker. Thank you, Dagny. And thank you, everyone, for coming. A little introduction. I hope the reasons for why I would undertake such a project are revealed by the content. But in brief, the characters are flawed, the ideas are generative, the art and writing is compelling, and the history may very well be instructive to our present moment. In specific, the fistfights, as in a moment when a person hits another person, generally in the face, I find quite baffling, maybe entertaining, and definitely alarming as a woman, as a 21st centurion, as an, and as an artist. In the course of studying the fistfights, I've made a discovery that will sound quite obvious, but still holds my interest. There are many versions of each fistfight. And I mean different versions from eyewitnesses. People who are actually standing there next to each other, viewing the same exact thing, will tell the event in a completely different way. How to reconcile these? Which one is correct? We can't really know. And so there remains many versions of each fistfight of the Surrealists and their repercussions and the fallout. And I welcome you, the audience, today to this lineage. You are a new set of witnesses who may or may not retell the story correctly or incorrectly, and we're now all repercussions of this event. What you're about to see is, let's say, a, read, a reading of a script done with the help of performers Norma Barak and Eli Diner and indebted to Dorna Kazani will take about 40-ish minutes. If you feel yourself losing focus, just pretend you're in your car listening to a podcast. <laughs> Chapter five. 
On the night of June the 14th, 1935, Andre Breton, founder of Surrealism, slapped Ilya Ehrenberg, a Soviet writer and journalist, either in the middle of Boulevard Montparnasse or on the sidewalk. It was not just one slap, it was multiple slaps. And we acknowledge a slap might not exactly be a fist fight. One person here was slapped by another person, but then that person was beaten up by another person, and the person who was slapped didn't slap anyone back. For those of you not familiar with him, Ilya Ehrenberg, the slapped, was a prolific Soviet writer, journalist, and cultural figure. According to Wikipedia, he wrote around 100 titles, though an article in the Journal of Historical Review in 1988 cites that he wrote almost 30 titles. A catalog search in the French National Library yields 218 titles. So moving forward, please assume when you hear specific facts that this is either the most accurate information from a very reliable source or an average. So for example, if Ehrenberg wrote 100 books plus 30 books plus 218 books divided by three, it means that he wrote 116 books. Ehrenberg was born on January 27, 1891, five years before Breton, to a non-religious Jewish family in Kiev. From 1925 to 45, he lived mostly in Paris as a foreign editor for Russian language newspapers. He became increasingly polemical, would come to be known as the leading Soviet propagandist during World War II. For the purpose of our story, he was an important critic and an authentic communist at a moment when Breton and the Surrealists desperately wanted to be recognized by the party leaders in Moscow. And in July of 1933, he published what turned out to be an incendiary little piece of criticism called Vu par un écrivain du RSS, as seen by a writer from the USSR, the Surrealists. It was translated and published in French in the newspaper L'Humanité on May 29, 1934. And that is when André Breton would have been confronted with Ehrenberg's rough takedown of the Surrealists. It begins. In an old Charlie Chaplin film, there's a picturesque, if somewhat unappetizing, incident. The hero enters a restaurant and orders fowl. He is no ordinary glutton, but the daintiest of epicures, and he likes the bird only when it is thoroughly putrid. He accordingly goes into the kitchen to see to it that the pheasant is sufficiently tainted. For connoisseurs of his sort, it is customary to hang the fowl up by the neck. When the neck rots off and the bird drops to the floor, the pheasant is ready to be put into the oven. The chef and his assistants are forced to hold their noses. Even their sense of professional duty is not strong enough to enable them to overcome their repugnance. Not so the delighted gourmet. He inhales the spoiled meat odor as greedily as if it came from a cluster of lilies of the valley. I am not quite sure as to whether the Parisian surrealists are to be compared to the pheasant strung up by the neck or to the wily chef. I'm not sure as to whether they are mentally sick or merely clever, these young fellows who make a trade of insanity. Who knows? After a rotten pheasant, the soul may yearn for a phosphorescent wrapper. Phosphorescent wrapper? And they have one, the surrealists. A weird phosphorescent wrapper enfolds a periodical entitled Le Surrealisme au service de la Révolution, or Surrealism in the Service of the Revolution, for the Parisian snobs are very fond of the revolution, as they are of cocktails and sexual perversions. Preoccupied with theories of masturbation and exhibitionist philosophies, these phosphorescent youths would make themselves out to be implacable revolutionary zealots and the champions of a proletarian purity. Their own program, in any event, is clear. They first read Marx, then hang out at a brothel. They have contempt for the manufacturers of saucepans and other utilitarian pursuits. What difference does it make to them and what sort of pan the chef prepares their putrid roast pheasant? What interest them is drinking, singing, and making love to the girls? This may be, for them, a sufficiently comprehensive program, but there is nothing particularly super realistic about it. Tens of thousands of young fellows of the well-to-do class divert themselves in the same fashion. Well, they might at least get out and demonstrate with the unemployed, but the police are in the habit of dispersing the unemployed, and the police carry rubber billies, and that is unpleasant. Anyway, you can see why Breton might have been upset coming across this article in the paper in May of 1934. 
When I found this English translation of Ehrenberg's text, which was published in 1935 in the Partisan Review, I was perplexed by the first paragraph and that description of the Chaplin film, the scene in the kitchen. In an old Charlie Chaplin film, there is a picturesque, if somewhat unappetizing incident. The hero enters a restaurant and orders fowl. Here, the Chaplin film is not named, but that's just in the English translation. In French, it is named L'Opinion Publique, or Public Opinion. But there is no Chaplin film called Public Opinion, which might be why the American translator left out the title. He was confused. However, I found that L'Opinion Publique was the French translation of the title of the 1923 Chaplin film, A Woman of Paris. That in itself is interesting. How does one equate a woman of Paris with public opinion? And this also means that writing in 1933, Ehrenberg is referring to a scene in a 10-year-old Chaplin film, a very short scene of little importance to the plot, which this film was also Chaplin's first drama and the first film in which he did not star. It was critically acclaimed and a total failure at the box office. Anyway, there's much to say about the film, but we have to get on. Um, oh, but first, I want to also talk about this phosphorescence, um, the phosphorescent wrapper that Ehrenberg was so hung up on. So I wanted to see it, the glow-in-the-dark wrapper or cover. It was described um, on the internet as a couverture procede radiana. What is radiana? I do not know. I searched for the periodical online in the bookstores and found one in November. It was offered for a very reasonable price at an antiquarian bookseller that happened to be in Panorama City, California. If you know where that is, it's essentially North Van Nuys. So I made an appointment to go see it. When I called to confirm, I was told the bookseller was on top of a swap meet. I found it eventually, as promised, on the second floor of one of those permanent indoor swap meets filled with all kinds of things from Mexico and China. Down a long hallway, tucked away from the stalls, I walked into a sprawling warehouse full of books. The bookseller seated me at an old table and brought the Surrealist periodical. I immediately saw that it did not have a phosphorescent wrapper. It had spine damage, and the wrapper must have been torn up or discarded. Here it is. But it was Christmas season, so I bought it, which is why I have it. And it also has a very beautiful Man Ray photograph inside that I hadn't seen before. Last month, I was invited by my friend Dorna to the Pasadena Antiquarian Book Fair. She had a house guest from Paris who was working at one of the booths. I made a little mental note to keep an eye out for Le Surrealisme au Service de Revolution. You might notice that Nor's the only one here who speaks French. <laughs> um, uh, and in case someone might have the periodical with the phosphorescent wrapper. So me, Dorna, and Nina, my baby, got to the book fair around 12.30. We got a great parking spot. We got in, immediately found the French house guest booths, and they had some great things, but nothing that I was looking for. After about an hour, though, we stumbled upon a booth that had a catalog listing all of their Surrealist and Dada wares. Flipping through, I saw that they had on offer a full set of Le Surrealisme au service de la Révolution. The Londoner manning the booth returned and I asked him if I could see the periodicals and see the phosphorescent wrapper, but he hadn't brought them from London. I told him that I had one of these things, but that it was missing the phosphorescent wrapper and he looked puzzled. I repeated myself, I said, I have one of these things, but it's missing the phosphorescent wrapper. And he then told me that in fact there was no phosphorescent wrapper, but that the ink for the title is what glows and that I had it the whole time. So, Dorna and I ran back to her house, shined the book in front of a bright light as he had told us to do and walked into the laundry room, but it wasn't glowing. In other words, it doesn't work. <laughs> Whatever radiana is, I know that it doesn't contain the radioactive chemical element radium because radium wouldn't need the light to glow. It would always be glowing. I don't know what radiana is. All I know is it's gone. But I have this periodical with a very beautiful Man Ray photograph inside. OK, so the fist fight. What happens? We warned you there's a few versions. You'll hear four of them. 
plus Dagny's from the beginning. So that's, that makes five. First, from Marc Palazzotti, the art historian and biographer of Breton. His book is called Revolution of the Mind, and Palazzotti's version gives us the background, what was going on with Breton leading up to the June 14th altercation. Breton had spent part of March and April in Prague and most of May in the Canary Islands doing a series of lectures and tours promoting surrealism. Breton's new wife, Jacqueline Namba, whom he had met in May 1934 and married three months later in August 1934, was about three months pregnant. Breton had never imagined having a child and was quite terrified, though still very much in love with Jacqueline. Breton needed money and had reluctantly accepted a job that month editing an international compendium of black humor. Black humor can be defined with an example from Freud's jokes in their relation to the unconscious. The condemned man who led to the scaffold on Monday cries, what a way to begin the week. The project was going terribly because Breton's idea of black humor seemed to be defined only by a handful of writers whom he had already written about as the forefathers of surrealism. For example, he had never read and possibly never heard of Mark Twain. And perhaps most significant to our story of this fistfight for reasons that will become apparent, Breton was fighting to be accepted as a delegate and speaker to the upcoming First International Congress of Writers for the Defense of Culture. It's 1935. You can infer that in the defense of culture means anti-fascist. The Congress was to be, gathering of, to be a gathering of nearly 3,000 delegates at the end of June with a full program of speeches. The organizing committee for the Congress included René Crevel, a surrealist poet active with the Communist Party with whom Breton was having a rocky relationship, Louis Aragon, a founder of surrealism who had already disavowed surrealism for communism and broken off his relationship with Breton, Tristan Zara, one of Breton's most public enemies, uh, as detailed in chapter one, and our villain, Ilya Ehrenberg. Despite such a hostile committee, Breton was determined that the Surrealists be a part of the Congress. He requested a place in the program in April and had received consent for the Surrealists to give one speech with no restrictions in content. Palazzotti describes the fistfight with a long quote from the memoir of Vitislav Nezval, the Czech poet with whom Breton had spent that spring in Prague, who happened to have arrived on that day, June 14th, in Paris. Nezval was one of the most prolific avant-garde Czech writers in the first hot half of the 20th century. After meeting Breton in May 1933, he co-founded the Surrealist Movement in Czechoslovakia in 1934. Nesval, that spring, had hosted Breton and Paul Eloir in Prague from March 27th to April 10th. It was a charmed week that Breton cherished as, quote, one of the most beautiful memories of my life. There he gave a series of lectures, the first called The Surrealist Situation of the Object, in which he analyzed surrealist art and poetry from a Hegelian perspective. In June, Nesval had come to Paris to spend a few weeks with his surrealist friends, but also to serve as a delegate to the International Writers' Congress. He wrote about his visit and published it in a book in 1936 titled Rue Gilles Le Coeur. It's a diary of sorts covering these days from June 14th to July 4th, 1935. Nesval starts out. Really, I would be overwhelmed if I could be welcomed in every city that I love for an afternoon as wonderful as this, June 14th, 1935. I do not like to travel. I would like to move from one place to another solely by thought. That's why I was so happy on June 14th of that year at two o'clock in the afternoon, coming up from the metro, the illusion of disembarking from nowhere on the Boulevard de Sebastopol. There seemed to be much more light than there is usually in metropolises. Nesval goes on to exclaim that the hotel that they had randomly chosen happened to be next door to one that's pictured in, Nadia's, in Breton's book, Nadia, and that the Hotel Pantheon made him feel like he was actually inside a De Chirico painting. As aperitif time came around, Nesval and the Czechs went up to the cafe on Place Blanche right near Breton's house where the Surrealists were known to have their daily meetings at aperitif time, and they waited, but Breton and Eloard didn't show up. The young garçon pointed out 
pointed them out to another patron who came to tell them, with an accent that seemed both Italian and Spanish, that the Surrealists that day were gathering in Montparnasse on the other side of town at a tabac near the Metro Respect. In these first pages of his memoir, Nesval mentions about every few sentences that his French is not so great, and that on this first day, quote, everything is going like a dream, end quote. Wanting to honor that feeling, I did the translations of these passages myself, which I am totally unqualified to do. Anyway, from the tabac, they went to a small restaurant near the Boulevard Montparnasse. Nesval dined with Breton, his wife Jacqueline, and Benjamin Perret, and then, he describes the fight. After dinner, walking along Boulevard Montparnasse, we approached the Closerie de Lila. Toyem pointed out to me that Ilya Ehrenberg had just left the cafe and was about to cross the street. Where is he? asked Breton. I've never seen him. Breton says to Ehrenberg, I have come to settle accounts with you, sir. Who are you, monsieur? inquired Ehrenberg. I'm André Breton. Who's that? André Breton repeated several times his name, and every time he teamed it up with one of these epithets Ehrenberg had written in his pamphlet of lies against surrealism. Each presentation was followed by a slap. Then it was left to Paré to settle accounts with the journalist. Ehrenberg did not defend himself. He stood, shielding his face with his hand. You were wrong to do that, he uttered when my friends had finished. Passersby gathered to watch this show gradually dispersed with friends, and friends rejoined us on the sidewalk. He had great satisfaction in this simple settling of accounts with the slanderer. Following Boulevard Montparnasse, we soon arrived at Manres. There, we amazed everyone with the story of the episode which we had witnessed. Manray was kind enough to show us his apartment and a great number of oil paintings from before the war, startling in their originality. The abstract structure of these paintings that constituted the background of a poetry at once harsh and fragile. Man Ray is little known as a painter, yet his early paintings reveal a great poetic and pictorial culture which exists in his photographs. The dates prove to us that Man Ray was one of the first to explore and take pleasure of the new spirit. After the tour, André Breton read us the speech he had prepared for the International Writers' Conference and invited us to submit our objections. All those present at the meeting of 14 June at Man Ray's house approved the formulation of his ideas. When we left, Man Ray handed me his business card and told me to call him at his studio where he made his photographs. André Breton and Paul Eluard hurried to the subway station to catch the last train going from Montparnasse. Jacqueline Lambert Breton, also a witness to the fight, said Breton was livid long after the incident. It was the first time I had ever seen such an act of personal violence provoked by indignation and disgust. It took André several hours to calm down. Ilya Ehrenberg had his own version of the events. Not surprisingly, the Russian's version lacks the detail and enthusiasm of Nesval's memoir. He also introduces the major fallout of the slapping incident, which was the suicide of René Crevel. Published in his three-volume memoir called People and Life, Ehrenberg's Remembrance of the Fight. On the eve of the Congress, we learned of the suicide of the young surrealist René Crevel. I sometimes met him and knew him and knew that he had strong feelings about the break between the Surrealists and the Communists. They said he had taken poison, leaving a short note, I am fed up with everything. Afterwards, from Crevel's friends, I learned quite unwittingly that I played a certain part in the tragic affair. I had written a sharply worded article about the Surrealists. One night we were sitting in a cafe and I went out to buy some tobacco. As I was crossing the street, two Surrealists came up to me and one of them struck me across the face. Instead of replying in kind, I stupidly asked, what's wrong? The act was quite in character with the Surrealists, but the silly incident was the last drop for René Crevel. Of course, a drop is not the whole cup, but it grieves me to recall it. And so here we are at the fallout. One of the casualties of this altercation between Breton and Ehrenberg was an actual casualty. The fight is linked to the suicide of René Crevel. Crevel, as mentioned earlier, was still technically a surrealist, but he was struggling with it. Crevel wrote to Tristan Zara in January of that year, the whole retrospective side of surrealist activity sickens me. He was struggling with a lot of things. He was also homosexual in Breton, and the surrealists were officially against homosexuality. He was a drug addict, and he was dying of tuberculosis and or lymphoma and or hereditary syphilis. Now, only 35 years old, he was ravaged by years of abuse and disease, and his once famously good looks were fading. In the introduction to Crevel's last novel, 
putting my foot in it. Eduardo Ditti writes that on June 17th, the day he committed suicide, Crevel had also found out that the tuberculosis, which he thought was cured, had in fact spread from his lungs to his kidneys. In, Poliz in Polizzotti's measured version of the suicide, he tells us the weekend after the slapping incident was rough for Crevel. Ehrenberg immediately demanded the Surrealists be stripped of their right to speak at the Congress. Crevel and a few others on the committee protested, but he was not able to make much headway. On Monday the 17th, during the regular Surrealist Cafe meeting, Crevel desperately called in to Paul Eloir, trying to get Breton to make some sort of conciliatory gesture toward the Soviets, but with no success. That night at a Congress meeting at the Closerie de Lila, he tried one last time to get the Surrealists on the program. Ehrenberg's only comment was, Breton acted like a cop. Finally, exhausted, Crevel went home, swallowed a handful of sedatives, and turned on the gas. Found along with Crevel's body the next morning was a terse note pinned to the lapel of his coat. Please cremate me, it wrote. Disgust. Salvador Dali was very close with Crevel at the time, and he provided a different view of the suicide published in his foreword to Crevel's novel, Difficult Death. Crevel was starting to look positively alarming. He thought he could find nothing better than the Congress of Revolutionary Artists and Writers to indulge in a barrel full of gruelingly Afro aphrodisiac excesses of ideological agony and contradiction. As a surrealist, Quinet honestly believed that without making concessions, we would be able to march in step with the communists. However, long before the opening of the Congress, the vilest intrigues and the most craven denunciations were set working to guarantee the pure and simple liquidation of the ideological platform occupied by our group. Crevel, shuttling to and fro between communists and surrealists, throwing himself into a succession of wearisome and despairing attempts to conciliate the two, moved back and forth between Crevel and René, as if in a revolving door between death and rebirth. A week went by, and I felt a sudden sharp pang of guilt. I must phone Crevel. Otherwise, he would think I had been won over to Breton, although the latter was as far as the Congress itself from sharing my Hitler-esque flights of fancy. When I finally did make the call, an unknown voice answered with Olympian disdain at the other end of the line. If you're a buddy of Crevel's, find a cab and get over here and make it snappy. He's dying. He tried to kill himself. I leapt into a taxi cab. Arriving in his street, I was amazed at the crowd. A fire truck was parked in front. I failed to grasp the connection between the firemen and the suicide. My first reaction, by a typical Dolanist association, was to imagine that suicide and fire had joined forces in the same building. I entered Crevel's bedroom jammed with firemen. With the gluttony of a nursing baby, René was, René was sucking oxygen. I never saw anyone cling so desperately to life. After having done himself in, in on the Paris city gas, he was trying to be reborn on the oxygen of Port Liga. Attached to his left wrist was a cardboard slip on which he had written himself his own neat capital letters, René Crevel. Because at that time I was still not altogether comfortable making phone calls, I rushed to the home of Vicomte and Vicomtesse de Noy. They had been friends of Crevel's. From their house I was enabled, with maximum tact and a modicum of style, to announce the news that was to stun Paris, news I had been the first to know. In the drawing room, glittering with gilded bronzes, against a black and olive green backdrop of Goya canvases, Marie-Laure de Noy pronounced a few words on Crevel that were so inspired they were instantly forgotten. Jacqueline Breton remembers the pain and confusion her husband felt after René Crevel's suicide and said he kept coming back to the share of responsibility that, in spite of himself, he might have had in the tragedy. A number of Crevel's friends did, in fact, hold Breton responsible, and his steely public response struck everyone as very cold. Palazzotti tells us that, by a twist of black humor, Crevel's tombstone was signed by its maker, a man named Breton. Translator David Ratre, in his introduction to the novel Difficult Death, acknowledges the Congress and illness as factors in Crevel's demise, but he develops an alternate theory, that Crevel was crushed in his last days, not by the balancing act between surrealists and the Congress, nor his tuberculosis, but by the fallout 
from the talk he gave the previous week on art and love and revolution to a working class audience. The talk was a total bomb and Crevel was left with the realization that, quote, he was just a rich kid with problems, slumming, or at this point, a burned out, once fashionable junkie in a world all his own, out of touch, spinning wheels, completely and irretrievably full of shit. And the truth of this matter burned to the core of an at last absolutely honest man, true poet that he was, and killed him. About two weeks ago, on the night of February 22nd, 2018, I was on the phone with Dorna while we were both looking at our computers, and she was graciously trying to help me figure out some French translations for Rene Crevel. Dorna said, well, you must have seen this blog I'm looking at about the fight, Breton versus Ehrenberg. And I said, no. She sends me the link, and there, what had been hidden from me by the algorithms of Google was a speculative description of the very fistfight of June 14th on a contemporary surrealist periodical called The Peculiar Mormid. <laughs> what a surrealist title, you might be thinking. And maybe you might wonder, what is a mormid? Nor? A mormid <laughs> is any of several species of slimy freshwater African fishes usually found in sluggish, muddy water. Their brains are proportionately very large, comparable to that of humans in relation to body weight. Enlarged areas of the brain indicate well-developed senses. But there's more. A loosely attached bony plate on each side of the head covers a vesicle that communicates with the internal ear. Paired electric organs of mild power present in the tail set up a continuous electric field around the fish, acting as a sensory screen. In other words, they are surrounded by an electric force field, and they also use the electric pulses to communicate with each other. In the peculiar Mormid, we get another and final version of the fight from the perspective of a present-day surrealist living in Ottawa <laughs> named Jason Abdelhadi. The bio under this article reads, Jason Abdelhadi is a librarian and aspiring surrealist medium in the tradition of Crevel and Desnas from Ottawa, Ontario. He forswears any and all talent and merely transcribes what is offered to him. His learning is comparable to that of Spunkmeyer's Faustus, humus, humanistic, edible, and entirely useless. He dedicates his every sleeping moment to the surrealist revolution in the hopes of a drastic future. His story begins. After dinner, the Paris Surrealists and their Czech cousins walked down the Boulevard Montparnasse on their way to Man Ray's place. When they got to the Closerie de Lila, Toyan pointed out to Nesval that Ilya Ehrenberg was leaving the cafe and about to cross the street. Where is he? demanded Breton. I've never seen him. Toyan pointed him out. I'm going to settle accounts with you, sir, Breton said, stopping Ehrenberg in the middle of the street. Who are you, sir? asked Ehrenberg. I am André Breton. But who are you, sir? André Breton's eyes grew red, and he danced up to Ilya Ehrenberg with the peculiar rocking, swaying motion that he had inherited from Arthur Craven. It looked very funny, but it is so perfectly balanced a gait that you can fly off from it at any angle you please. And in dealing with miserableists, this is an advantage. I am André Breton, the onanist, and he slapped him. If Breton had only known he was doing a much more dangerous thing than fighting a mere journalist, for an apparatchik is so small and can turn so quickly. But Breton did not know. His eyes were all red, and he rocked back and forth, looking for a good place to hold. I am André Breton, the pederast, and he slapped him. Ehrenberg struck out. Breton jumped sideways and turned to run in, but the wicked little dusty gray head slashed with a fraction of his shoulder, and he had to jump over the body. I am André Breton, the fetishist, and he slapped him. Ehrenberg braced, him, braced himself with a shake and became 10,000 fathoms tall. His face was black, his fangs were long, and his hair was bright red. He looked ferociously evil. He hacked at Breton's head. Breton, also resorting to magic, gave himself a body as big as Ehrenberg's and a face as frightening, and he raised his surrealist object to ward off Ehrenberg's blow. I am André Breton, the exhibitionist, and he slapped him. Toyen shouted to the surrealists, oh, look here, our Breton is killing a snake. By the time he came up, Breton has sprung, jumped on the Soviet's back, dropped his head far between his forelegs, 
bitten as high up the back as he could hold and rolled away. That bite paralyzed Ehrenberg, and Breton was just going to eat him up from the tail after the custom of the early Dadaists when he remembered that a full meal makes a slow surrealist. And if he wanted all his strength and quickness ready, he must keep himself thin. I am André Breton, the sodomizer, and he slapped him one last time. So upon finding a living surrealist interested in the very same subject matter as I was, I excitedly and enthusiastically reached out to the contact email of the Ottawa Surrealist Group blog, trying to find Jason. February 20th, 2018, at 3.26 p.m. Bonjour. I'm trying to reach Jason Abdelhadi. I am an L.A.-based artist, and I've been working for years on a project I call Le New Monocle, the history of the fistfights of the Surrealists. One of my chapters is about the altercation between Breton and Ilya Ehrenberg. I stumbled across Jason's piece about it on the in the peculiar Mormurid. I would love to ask him some questions and share this project with him. I'm actually working on a lecture about that Ehrenberg fight right now to be performed on March 4th, and I'd be really excited to be in touch about it. Here's a link and a brief inf and some information about my performance. It's at http <laughs> colon slash slash www.lacma.org slash event slash Shauna dash Lutker. Jason, I'd love to hear from you. All best, Shauna. Two hours and 20 minutes later, I received a response. Shauna, it's all well and good that you're interested in fistfights. I recently read a very interesting article in the 14 Times about the history of boxing kangaroos, which might be pertinent here. I mean, it's a sensational thing to see a kangaroo jabbing at a greedy impresario. Certainly, it made the rounds in Australia, the UK, the US, to the point where it actually became something of a cliche. But in the end, the marsupial pugilists were only vaguely imitating some combative instincts that they may have had in the wild. The whole thing is rather depressing, actually. As for the boxing surrealists, no. I can't help but feel that the kangaroo might suit your purposes better. There aren't many boxing kangaroos left, you see. It would be quite easy to do an art project on them. But there are a few surrealists. And I'm afraid, unlike our friend Jack from the Outback, we're not ready to be a historical curiosity, or what's worse, a subject to be interpreted from the outside. We expect far too much from life to want to refer to it coolly, at a distance, commenting from the sidelines. Our fights, we like to think, are very real, and we still look for black eyes beyond good and evil where we can find them. Yes, I wrote that piece to try and connect with the spirit of Breton's slap. Perhaps I would have done better to go out and pick some new fights of my own. You say you're interested in surrealism. Perhaps you feel the same way. What do you expect from life, from dreams, revolution, or even art, if there is such a thing anymore? If those questions seem pertinent, then we can certainly talk. Perhaps you have the same anxieties we do. But if you're someone who resonates with that strange call from outside, then surely you can see why a contemporary artist doing a project on surrealists long dead might be suspicious to surrealists still living. Like most living endangered species, we don't appreciate surreptitious taxidermy. I don't know where you stand, knife in hand. From what I can tell, I suspect you think the surrealist movement is a long past thing, that these hilarious little historical episodes make for a perfect interpretive springboard for ideas about spectacle, theater, media hysterics, or whatever other critical apparatus you might want to apply. If you think the surrealists were about theatrics or establishing a brand name in art, you'd do better to stop reading commercial biographies and start reading the actual source texts, or maybe some of the contemporaries. You can look to Chicago, Paris, Leeds, Madrid, Prague, Stockholm, and many others easily found for those willing to look. I'm not sure if this applies to you, but it is weird to us to find so many people, that, it is weird to us that so many people find it so hard to take the surrealists at their word. Do we have to treat them at such a distance as if the movement really did die? in 45 or 69 or whatever arbitrary date they choose. If surrealism today is an underground phenomenon, at least we can say that we're far from being simply satisfied with overt navel-gazing and necrophiliac obsessions with our own past. Of course, North American art criticism and academia have been particularly eager to bury surrealism. So, no, I'm not at all interested in discussing Breton versus Ehrenberg as such. 
I'm much more interested in tomorrow's prize fights with whatever megafauna we can convince to get in the ring. Signed, Jason Abdelhadi. The end. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Very, thank you very much. Um, Shana has a book. Shana has a book um, up there. If you want, she'll sign a copy for you. Uh, get a drink and hang out for a little bit. Um, meet the performers and her. And uh, thank you for coming. Thank you.